Good evening, everybody. I'm Kevin Addix with Apprentice House Press, coming from you, uh, coming to you live from my uh, vehicular studio. Um, it's where the Wi-Fi was good tonight. So, uh, wanted to welcome everybody to our our inaugural authors interviewing authors, where we're talking uh, not only us talking with the authors, but the authors interviewing each other, which is a very cool concept. And we are excited to get started. Um, before we turn it over to the true talent, the actual authors, I wanted to mention a few words about Apprentice House Press. First, we have two missions at Apprentice House, which is uh, a publishing company at Loyola University, Maryland. The first, we publish great work by amazing authors. So that's our number one goal. But in so doing, we're providing an incredible learning experience for our undergraduate students who are interested in editing, marketing, design, and overall publishing in, in the uh, book world. Um, so learn more and hopefully buy some books by visiting ApprenticeHouse.com. And I'll remind you of that uh, throughout this stream. And use the code word STREAM for 20% off all purchases. So with that, to introduce our authors, I wanted to bring up uh, two of our students who are playing the role of our marketing directors and promotion directors this uh, semester. So Taylor DaCosta and Sarah Ford, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you could be here and, and, and thanks for helping to conceive this whole concept. So uh, I'll jump off the screen and let you introduce our authors. Oh, so thank you all for coming. So we have two amazing authors here tonight. We have Juan Cassie and Lynn Beatty. So I'll be introducing Juan Cassie. Juan Cassie is the author of If You Love Baltimore, It Will Love You Back, 171 Short But True Stories, which was published in October of 2020. Juan Cassie is a senior editor at the Baltimore Magazine, where he won national awards for his coverage of the deaths of Freddie Gray, climate change, in the opioid epidemic, garnering praise from the Pulitzer Center, Brooklyn Institute, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. Previously, he reported from Haiti in the days of the tragic earthquake, New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, and the Greensville Correction Center during the execution of John Allen Muhammad. Twice the Religious New Writers Associ Association named him a National Reporter of the Year finalist. His works have appeared as a notable selection of the best of American sports writing in a Newsweek, the New York Daily News, the New York Post, Huffington Post, Grits, the Baltimore Sun, Baltimore City Paper, and Urbanite, where he served as editor-in-chief before coming to Baltimore. He holds graduate degrees in Georgetown University and the John Hopkins University, where he now teaches in the Master of Arts writing program. Prior to becoming a full-time journalist, he spent almost two decades swinging a hammer, riding a bike, and pouring drinks for a living. He lives in a row house near Patterson Park and describes Baltimore, where he arrived from Allentown, Pennsylvania in the mid 80s as his spiritual home. Okay. And I will be introducing Lynn Beatty. Um, Lynn Beatty is the daughter of a Highland Town tavern owner and a school teacher was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. She is a senior lecturer at Murtaya in the writing program at Wellesley College, where she taught for three decades. A graduate of Mercy High School in Baltimore, she attended the College of Notre Dame of Maryland, now Notre Dame University, and received her Bachelor of Arts in English from Barnard College and her Master's of Arts from Teachers College, Columbia University. She earned her PhD in English and JD from Boston College, where she was a university fellow. She has also taught at several college and universities, including Boston University, Boston College, Olin College of Engineering, and Brandeis University. She is the author of two poetry collections, Baltimore Girls, published in 2017, and the Glamorganshire Bible, published in 2018, and a short fiction collection, Going Too Fast, published in 2020. Her poetry, nonfiction, and fiction appeared in over 150 journals and anthologies, including The Wire, Urban Decay, and American Television, The Baltimore Sun, Welcome to the Neighborhood, Bad Hombres and Nasty Woman, and Callas Nectis Spididis. She had been awarded recognition in the Walmart slash Joe Guvia Outermost Poetry Contest, the Allen Ginsberg Poetry Contest, and the Glimmer Train Short Fiction Contest, and has been nominated for the Best of the Net Anthology in the Maspic Award. She now lives in Massachusetts with her family. Oh, 
Oh, we couldn't hear you, Kevin. Yeah, so. of course, because I had it on mute. You're so, muted. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. So uh, we really appreciate that, Sarah and Taylor. So without further ado, let's welcome Lynn Vitti and Ron Cassie. We will bring them up. And uh, Ron may be having connection issues, but I'm sure he's there. Um, so there he is. Ron's back. So let's get rolling. So uh, the new new concept, new format, um, but the concept is authors interviewing authors, and uh, you're the authors, I'm not. So, <laughs> so long. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, it's really a pleasure to do this. I'm I'm thrilled that um, Ron Cassie and I are the um, the first to do this authors interviewing authors. So we will get right into it. Um, you heard Ron's pretty impressive biography. I'm going to just jump in um, because I've I've read um, a significant number of the pieces in his book. If you if you love Baltimore, we'll love you back. A great title. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you because I noticed in your in your several versions of your biography, including the one on your your uh, your own. Um, website, you do note that you swung a hammer and, and, and served and mixed drinks for two decades before becoming a journalist. So that was very interesting to me because um, usually people these days, unlike back in the 30s and 40s, and even 50s, go to journalism school first yeah. and emerge on the market as a, as a journal, as a young journalist at age 23 or 24. So um, what, what was going on during the time you were um, working with your hands? And obviously, um, were you reading? Were you thinking <laughs> about writing? Or were you already writing? Like, how did you, how did you uh, no. get from that, that kind of um, everyday work, service work, or trades work to uh, yeah. becoming a journalist? That's it. Uh, it's a great question. I appreciate you asking. You know, it's um, um, no, I really wasn't thinking about writing. You know, I, I uh, after high school, um, I went to college for a year, mostly because I wanted to play football, and um, didn't really have much interest in school. And when I uh, had an injury, essentially, I couldn't play football. I played one year of college baseball. Um, you know, I started swinging a hammer and, and framing houses and doing what um, essentially most of my buddies did now in town. Um, Pennsylvania, and um, you know, I, uh, I I attended bar after that and managed bars, and, and then I um, you know I quit that and became a, a bike messenger, started my own courier de delivery service in, in D.C. Bike messenger business, and it was after doing that for about five or six years, you know, um, uh, really death defying kind of work, being outside every day and meeting a, a really a great bunch of. Um, you know, slightly crazy characters for sure in the bike messenger world, you know, guys who compete in mountain biking, but there's also photographers and artists and, um, you know, an eclectic group, you know? Um, and I really started to, to paint a little bit and I, and I started to, I'd like, I'd like to draw when I was a little kid and, um, I, I started taking pictures and, um, eventually I think I wanted to tell, you know, stories. Um, and I wrote, I did some freelance pieces when I was still a bike messenger for a DC Metro sports, which was a, a local, um, uh, sports magazine in DC. I did stories for, uh, spokes magazine, which was a mid Atlantic bicycling. So very much just grew out of my interest in cycling and bike messenger and the buddies, the guys I hung out with, um, wrote stories about us playing bike polo in the park on Friday night, you know, till, Two in the morning, guys just you know smoking pot and drinking beer and, and banging each other with these handmade mallets on, on our bikes while we played polo at McPherson Square. Um, I had a buddy who was a uh, like fifty years old and he he was a um, elite triathlete. He he would get on the podium at the Hawaii Ironman Triathlon in his age group and he had survived like stage three four cancer. He was like a real life Lance Armstrong and he did his bike training by being a bike messenger. Um, Captain Tom, because he was in the military, he's retired. Captain Tom, what we called. So it kind of grew organically out of that. I didn't think I could make a living as a painter, and, and I'm pretty sure I couldn't. 
Um, uh, I thought maybe being a photographer, I would just a lot of being outside every day and 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 um, being with a collected group of people. I, a lot of lights were coming on inside. You know, it's just it's just experiencing things that were new and different and and. Um, uh, so that's where it started. So then I decided to go back to college. You know, I thought maybe I should finish college. So I went back to college. And um, you know, to your point, like I, I had a moment of like existential crisis. Like I was like 39. I was an undergraduate. So you're not just older, 20 years older than the students. You're older than professors you're taking, right? <laughs> of course. You know, a great professor named, um, very, very um, humbling in a good way, experience, Michael Peterson at Towson. And I went to him, I said, you know, what am I even like doing this for? Because what am I, like, I'm going to be 40 years old and get a job at a daily newspaper, like, and climb some ladder. And I mean, that's, that doesn't seem like that's going to, you know, it doesn't seem, I don't know, possible, um, likely. So he said, don't worry about it. You know, you create your own paradigm to succeed, you know. Um, and I believed them just the way he said it. You know, I just kind of believed them. And, and I'll, I'll just say this because I, I think you're alluding to this earlier. I wasn't really reading a lot, but what I, I did read the newspaper magazines all along, you know, my whole life. I kind of was that kind of reader. Um, I liked reading books when I was a kid. Um, I didn't really read high school, college, or anything like that. I mean, like serious literature, a couple of things you acquired to read in high school. Um, but I knew when I read stories in a newspaper, whether they were uh, an Orioles game, you know, replay or a, a feature story on one of the ball players or news or a magazine feature story or news. Like I understood how it was put together in a, in a weird way. Like I'm not really mechanically oriented, even though I framed houses and could build a house and stuff. Like I, I, I don't really intuitively understand how a car is put together. Like buddies of mine, right. They could really do that. Um, but I did it reading this paper like i knew i could do that for some reason um and uh yeah so that's that's how i got i got started for, you know just being a bike man. i think we have a some technical difficulties, yes. but well, a glitch in the connection. Let's see if it comes back. It ain't live unless it's glitchy. That's right. Once Ron's back, we'll we'll pick him up where he left off. There we go. Oh. When the glitch is bad enough, they're they're cut off. So. Um, We'll give Ron a second to come back on. Okay. Is it just me or could you look at Ron and guess um, that guy was a bike messenger? Yeah. He had, a, he had that look. I know. I A friend's brother has did it for years. I think I think he's aged out because now because he's about 60. But he did it. It was really daredevil work. Sorry. Am I back? Yeah. Yes. Perhaps, Perhaps. For some reason, it's never happened for it. For some reason, it says I have a weak internet signal where I am. Um, so, um, yeah, long, uh, long, long story short, that's how I uh, that's how I started freelancing and, and writing, um, and uh, yeah, somehow it has worked out. So, um, you worked at the Baltimore Sun for a while. I didn't. I work at the Sun. I, my first job was at the Howard County Times, uh, a weekly paper, and, and, and um, I did. Um, I did my first big, my real break in some big stories. Like I mean, like lengthy, like five thousand word cover stories were for the Baltimore City paper, and mm -hmm. um, that's really where I got um, started into like kind of long form journalism. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, some of the stories in in your book. This, if if I understand correctly, are um, shortened some somewhat from the original long form. Is that, or do I, do I have that right, or or are most of the ones in the book really short? I mean, I, I've read a few of them. I've read some of them, and um, I don't. Can you? Hear I'm sorry, me? Lynn. Could you repeat that again? I don't know why my yeah. yeah yeah my yeah. internet signal isn't good. For um, for some reason, it's, 
when I read when I read some of the stories in your book, they they seem to be. Um, I think you they seemed to be perfect the length they were. But I think you had said when we were chatting earlier um, before this program that that you um, kind of condensed some of them or or made them shorter than they were originally. Is that or do I have that backwards? <laughs> oh, we really are having technical difficulties. It's funny, the reliance to uh, Wi-Fi, right? It's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, it's the, the top commodity since, uh, since all this began about a year ago. Right. I know when we when we're down um, at the beach um, where we have a little fisherman's cottage, the the internet is pretty unstable. It's it's here at home. I think there are enough towers around, but it depends on where you are and how many other people are hopping on. I guess too, but since everyone's on all the time, one would think time, time, time of day, weather. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. How's this? That's good. That's good. All right, I moved to, I moved to, I moved to a new location. My, my apologies okay. for that. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So, okay. So I was just, let's talk about let's talk about some of the the, the stories in the book. Um, okay. Or let's talk about um, some something that I had um, noticed. If you if you Google Ron Cassie in Baltimore, you get a lot of hits that say um, Freddie Gray. So. Uh -huh. Can you talk a little bit about what you wrote about the death of Freddie Gray and how that fits into some larger theme of, of some of the work that you've done? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, my my job at, the, at Boulder Magazine is kind of evolved, I guess, or maybe it was always this way. You know, I kind of toggle back between um, doing like kind of deep dives and, and, and uh, investigative pieces about, um, you know, things that are in the news, I mean, recently about gun trafficking, about where all the firearms in Baltimore like actually come from, how they come from states generally in the deep south that have weaker gun laws and, and are trafficked up to Baltimore and sold. And things like I think you read in the intro, like climate change, and the opioid epidemic. And then I also do, you know, more um, profiles and, and, and feature oriented stories. And, um, you know, that, and I think when our long form narrative pieces, the investigative pieces, you know, it's an effort to combine the two together, right? Like, it's so, it's not, so it's not just a, um, a Baltimore uh, or, or daily newspaper kind of investigative piece um, that's, uh, you know, just merely fact after fact after fact of what was uncovered, but it's connecting that to human stories and, and neighborhood stories on a local level that are, that are, um, you know, told in a way that there's a narrative arc to the story, not just the uncovering of, um, you know, where, where weapons are coming from or the amount of sea level rise change, but what that impact is really like in communities. Um, you also do a lot of um, interesting um, personal profiles, I guess. Um, Barbara Mikulski, right, Elijah Cummings. Um, I didn't get a chance to read the one about the old Jewish boxers, but that's on my my to read list. So my another question that occurred to me and that I was curious about is, how do you find these stories? How do you how did you find the boxers story? How do you stumble on those? Were you able to hear me? I'll say it again. You know, I think. Um, <laughs> As you mentioned in the lead, like you know, I, I live in the city. I live in a row house neighborhood by Patterson Park. My, I, I can hear you. Link. You hear me? Mm -hmm. No, I can't. Am I am I off again? I'm, I apologize. This I don't know why my internet connection is is weak. It never is. We can hear you. It's just a little bit of a delay. It's mm -hmm. uh brought to us by Murphy's Law here, right?
Ron, are you back with us? I think Ron's become his own IT department at the moment. Checking through it. Well, while, while Ron is uh, working through that, um, Lynn, Lynn, can I just uh, ask you what your impression was uh, reading through Ron's work? Well, I think when I read it, I almost feel like I, I'm in it, I'm in a Baltimore that's very somewhat the Baltimore I remember, right? Because I'm acquainted with some of these th things, like you know the rise of ba Barbara Mikulski. But other times, it's a whole different Baltimore that I'm very curious about. And I know that all of Baltimore isn't exactly like the wire. I get that, but um, I'm very, I'm very intrigued to hear. Like one of the things I wanted um, to Ron to talk about was um, the um, um, Tater Dante Tater Barksdale, who who was uh, who died just about two months ago by gunshot, um, because I think this that story about how somebody who went to prison came out um, became um, a community um, activist um, became a, uh, a peacemaker really um, that's it, it's almost like um, life imitating art it, 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 it could be it could be a, a chapter in um, you know the wire which was set what in in the 90s but it's right now um, and I think, um, the the kind of it, it, what was it what was the quote from Trump? He said Baltimore was a, a very dangerous and filthy place, and that this belies a lot of what what is so much the opposite about Baltimore. Yet I think those stories uh, they, it almost sometimes like I feel like I'm reading fiction, and I'm very very drawn into it. Um, the and I kind of forget it's when you're drawn into a work of fiction, you be, enter that world and you. You, you sort of lose yourself in it. And that's what I find when I'm reading some of Ron's work. So even though it's nonfiction and, and it's reportage and it's, it's deep dive journalism, to me, it's, it's as gripping as, as when I'm reading a work of fiction that I really get taken over by. So Ron, think, you, you, it looks like you're back with us. I don't know if, if there's audio. I, I can barely hear you, Lynn. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can now. Um, and so I've sent the book to um, a, cu a couple I, relatives. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Um, I sent, I've sent the book to my cousin, um, to my sister. Um, these are people who grew up in Baltimore but no longer live there, and they love it. They love it. So I, I would love to see like a really longer work like a whole book that is is sort of one of these deep dives many times over. I mean, I, I, I would I would sign up to read that. And, and that, that's that's the feedback that we got um, from Ron's work. And that, that's one of the reasons why we loved it was um, the stories were so rich yeah. to the point where, and I, let's see if Ron's back with us, um, the, the, the stories were so rich that in some instances, you you couldn't tell if these were, you know, fiction or nonfiction. And and well, I remember a couple of our acquisitions editors asked that question. You right. know, they said, "Is is this real?" And and I think part of that's the story, but so much of it's the writing. It is and, the writing. Yeah. yeah. And I think uh, one of the pieces that I quite liked, and it's not in the book, is um, one that talks about. Um, Pennsylvania Avenue back in the forties and what a, um, you know, what a musical scene it was. It, it, there were, and the story is a, a tragic story in that um, a man who had just was on leave from the army had a black man had gone with his friends down to hear Louis Armstrong and they had a long late night. They, they, they heard the music and they were going home and the um, they wanted to hail a cab 
and they got into an altercation with a police officer and um, because they wanted to hail a cab or have a cab driven by a person of color. And the police officer, for some reason, just didn't wanted them out of there, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, they, he ended up um, shooting the man and the man died of a gunshot. So this is a lead into a story about that and what that world was like and Billie Holiday played there and you know all of these uh, James Brown, but it also links it to things that happen today in terms of of the police in the in the communities of color. So it was it was a very rich piece and it brought so many of these threads together. Um, and I think that that's another just just educate. I mean, readers today don't know that pencil unless unless they have studied it or they have grandparents who lived it, don't know that you could see Billie Holiday on Pennsylvania right. Avenue. Right. Didn't right. know that there was a rich um, um, middle-class black community um, in Baltimore. Ron, looks like you're back. Yeah. <laughs> good, okay. good. All right. Hopefully the, the internet connection will stay. I'm not really sure why I'm having such problems. Okay. So what's next, Ron? What's your next project? Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, guys. Let me, let me try setting up a different computer and see okay. if that helps. I'll let you guys take it for now, OK? All righty. All right, so, so with that, um, it, it'll, be, it'll be publisher interviewing author for a moment. Um, <laughs> How about that? Um, so, so Lynn, let, let's let's talk about your work. Um, what 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 got you to the point of writing this work? Had 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 it been years in the making? Was it spontaneous? No, I, it wasn't. It wasn't like years and years in the making, but it was was fairly recent. Um, I'm trying to think. I think it was probably about 14, 2015, probably about six or seven years ago that I had my chance encounter with um, Baltimore born Sam Cornish, who um, was uh, kicking around Baltimore after he got out of the army and was being a poet. And I guess, and I understand quite a party giver. <laughs> a lot of people remember he gave, gave great parties in, in his apartment in, in uh, I don't know, it was downtown somewhere. And he eventually found his way to Boston, which is where I found my way to, but I did not know that. I mean, as far as I was concerned, he was just a vo uh, somebody that I had heard read poetry when I was a high school kid in a folk club. And I didn't, it's not that I forgot about him. Every once in a while, I think, whatever happened to that guy? Unbeknownst to me, he had been, he had really become part of a poetry community in Boston. And I wasn't in the poetry community because I was teaching and then I w went to law school and then I was um, having children and living in the suburbs. And I just didn't hang around with poets. I mean, I knew some people who wrote poetry, but I wasn't part of that this very vibrant community. Um, Sam eventually, Sam worked in a bookstore for years. And it was a bookstore that my husband and I went to often. But I didn't know that that Sam was Sam Cornish until one day I heard him page by his full name over the loudspeaker at this big warehouse book place. And I went and found him and said, you know, I, I heard you read poetry. You were the first poet I ever heard read when I was in high school. And he, he was very sweet. He said, oh, you've made my day. But he said, you know, I, I he didn't say I'm poet laureate of Boston. He said, I do a writing poetry workshop at the Boston Public Library, you should come. And I, I don't know, I didn't even think about it, I went. And it, it just opened up this whole world to me. And I had scribbled poetry, but I, he, he really, and he, he would confer with us individually and he, and he just was very encouraging. You know, here I was, you know, 60. And um, I thought, well, never too late. And I did start sending them out. And I was always, you know, for every rejection, I would have an acceptance and I, I couldn't believe it. Um, with the internet it is much easier to submit work than it used to be. But there is just, it, I, it isn't just Boston. I mean, there are these little communities everywhere of, of poets. And I 
continue to do those workshops, not only with him, but then with his successor. Um, so I, I, I think that that when you know that you have to show up with something, you know, you have to show up with something every week. Um, it makes you write something. There's a little pressure. Yeah. And then, so, and then once I did that, then I started to get involved in these sort of um, group enterprises where everyone goes to this farm and every, and there's a theme every year and you've got, you, you choose a place or you choose a plant or you choose a sculpture, an outdoor sculpture and, and you, you're committed to it. Now you have to do it. So now I've gotten to the point where, um, you know, I've, I think I've pretty much exhausted the poems about my past, which was, you know, there's a lot of that in Dancing at Lake Montebello, and I'm really focusing more on work right now. I also was teaching for many years, and teaching is a, is a great energy suck, as you know. I mean, it's really hard to do that well, especially if you're a writing teacher, and have enough time left over to do your own writing. Um, and what were you teaching? I was teaching expository writing. You know, I was teaching mm -hmm. co composition 101 or whatever it's called in many places. And, you know, it was, um, the, I was lucky because I had small classes, but, you know, my students were, you know, they really needed to learn how to write an academic essay. They were so used to just writing for the test. So, and um, I, and I was always teaching in summers and so on. Um, so I think it's it's hard to carve out a space. I think my kids were were adolescents at the time, and that takes a lot of time and supervision and kind of monitoring and and kind of making sure they're in the right direction too. So so I didn't have a lot of time or energy to do writing all those years, and and it's like it came back to me. I mean, I did a lot of writing in in college, creative writing, and I took courses. And, um, in college in fiction writing um, and in non-creative nonfiction. I hadn't done much poetry. Um, and I think what happened for me too as well, because I, I find it very hard to sustain drafting and revising um, fiction. Mm -hmm. But poetry, it's like poetry became the escape. It became the avoidance technique. So the more trouble I've had getting back to the extended fiction work, the, and the, the more I use this as an avoidance technique, the more poetry I produced. <laughs> well, I, I, I hope you continue to avoid the long form then, because uh, we, we very much enjoyed the, the poetry. Uh, when, when did you write your first poem? Um, probably in high school. Um, I think probably in high school. I mean, I used to, we used to, you know, I was a Girl Scout, you know, we, we did all kinds of little doggerel kind of things, but the first serious poem, probably in high school um, and probably towards the end of high school. Um, I had a couple of things published in our school literary magazine. And I think one of them got submitted to the National Catholic Press Association. I got a prize, whatever, you know, I don't know what the prize was, a certificate, but um, in college I did. And, and the stuff was just, it's like, oh, it, it's just, I wouldn't say it's bad, but I taught creative writing to high school students. It's just a lot of that adolescent angst and not really knowing how to harness that. Um, so I have some of that. I, I've saved it just to, re, to keep humble. Um, it's in the file with some of my not great work that needs revision or needs pitching that I work contemporaneously with. But Everybody has those files. Yeah, yeah. They're not great work. Ron, yeah. looks like you're you're back. Are you back? I I went to a desktop computer, my work computer. I set up in my living room, so uh, maybe this will be better than the, than the laptop. I, I apologize. I I was on the laptop with a. I did a guest lecture thing today with um, UMBC. It was seamless, right? I, there, work I, it. I did a new <laughs> thing. So. Yeah. Well, well, uh, I'll is it, to stick on format. I will jump back off the screen, and and uh, Ron, I just started asking Lynn. Um, some questions about her history, um, just yeah. kind of went w w how she came up with the uh, collection, and and uh, but I'm sure she's got another question for you. Yeah, I I wanted to know, Ron, what's what what um, next book project you have, um, even if it's like a far off thought. I mean, there was some discussion that you were going to be going into a graduate program. Is that yeah? I I I'm I'm scheduled to uh, start a um. Uh, Worked towards my PhD at Georgetown in liberal studies in, in the fall. I wanted to wait till we could actually go back to class to do that because I yeah. 
it's really explaining this to a friend. Um, you know, just it, going through the Masters of Liberal Arts program at Georgetown and studying uh, uh, literature and religion there was just, just such a great experience. I it was a highlight of my week, you know, driving down and going to class and mm -hmm. looking forward to it. And, um, you know, is, is it, you know, I know you're in, acad in academia. You know, you'd write something that's like 15 pages, only one person's going to read it. And I never thought as a journalist I would be interested or bothered to do that, but I really enjoyed it so much. So I'm looking forward to pursuing that. Um, as far as writing, um, I got a couple things uh, in the works besides my normal job at the, my day job at the magazine. I'm, I'm hoping to uh, um, write a fictional piece I'm working on about, uh, about, about the time living in DC in the nineties when I was a bike messenger and things like that, kind of setting that, that period. Um, so uh, yeah, trying to trying to do new things all the time, you know, keeps things interesting and fun. I, I you know, like you're growing, you know, trying to do new things. Um, but yeah. Do you ever, um, when you've written one of these um, journalistic pieces, do you ever get any um, sort of pushback or you know from from your subject like? Why did you say this? Or I didn't like this. Or that's <laughs> um, not, you didn't really explain X. Or or people yeah. I, not you know not too much. I mean, to, you know, really, I try to be really upfront with people what I'm writing about, what my intention is, what the piece is about. Um, I mean, for a long time, when you're interviewing and writing and researching, you're learning as you go what the piece is going to be about what the ultimate thing is you know but i try to be really clear about that and when i call people back to fact check pieces and um say you know you, you told me this and it's related to this and um occasionally sometimes people push back a little bit well i didn't mean to say it that way and you'll say yeah but you know it's what you said and it rings you know and you know if people clarify like that's fine um you know if but for the most part, I don't want anybody to be surprised about what they read. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't expect anybody to be surprised. And, and so I don't think I, I hear too much of that. I'm not, I'm pretty upfront with what I'm setting out to do, you know. Who, who's the, who was the, the most fun person that you, that you interviewed and wrote, made the focus of, of one of your pieces in the last, say, 10 years? Um, you know, that's, that's stuff like, um, Mary Carol Riley, the the you were going to say that I, I yeah player like that was a lot of she was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, we played um, some Texas Hold'em together with uh, you know a, a local elected official and some <laughs> some uh, you know some other folks and, and kind of a I won't say illegal card game but like a backroom kind of card game and we went to the, the Horseshoe Casino together and. Um, you know, she's like my mom's age and stuff, and she's really live wire and fun. So that was, you know, that was great. But, you know, it was great to go spend um, Jim Palmer's 50th opening day with the Orioles with him and, and go on the field and have him throw out the first pitch and, you know, sit in the broadcast booth for the whole game. I mean, um, I don't know if Jim had as much fun as I did, but I, but yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I, I don't think he minded having somebody along, but. Um, so that was just as a, you know, as a kid, as a, who loved baseball and stuff like that was, that was, you know, certainly a lot of fun, but, um, you know, every story I'm really interested in and the people I'm, or, or I wouldn't, or I wouldn't do it. It's not that I enjoy the writing process that much. It's the discovery and meeting people. That's, that's fun. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if somebody, you know, if I feel like I've, 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 I've gotten something I've experienced. Like I'm kind of compelled to share it with other people. And so that, that's what happens. Um, well, there's a real variety um, in, in this book, particularly. Yeah. You, I heard you mention, I'm sorry about the internet connection. Oh, yeah. mention, like Dante Barksdale, you know, Yeah, yeah. Dante, I knew uh, I first met like 12 years ago in the first pieces uh, for the Baltimore magazine I ever did. And, and you know, spent some time with him uh, when Safe Streets was brand new, and you know he's a he's funny guy, like in a sarcastic way, and 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 super intelligent. And you know, there's he was great to be around. You know, even when he was deadly serious and talking about the work he did, he was a, 
compelling figure um, who's the city and his friends and the neighborhoods and um, you know, kind of redeeming his own life as a young man by, by, by working to make the city a better place and working with young men now. Um, he was he was a fantastic person to be around, you know, um, just as like Erica Bridgeford is today. It's just um, you can't help but, um, you know, your own soul to be kind of moved by the work that they do and who they are. And, and I don't know if that's like fun in the classic sense of like playing Texas Hold'em all night, but um, it's kind of what I call fun. I mean, it's if I'm if I'm learning, I'm having fun. If I'm with somebody who's smart and interesting and and you know, doing something meaningful to me, that's um, that's that's fun for me. So I don't know what that was that, that what that says about me. I'll give you one more fun one. So I did a um, uh, Bob uh, Wagner is a Baltimore um, bicyclist guy. And um, he does a, a bunch of long rides every year. He did a, he does an annual monument to monument ride. It's a bike ride. It's not a race. It's like recreational ride um, from Baltimore's Washington Monument to the D.C. Washington Monument and back. And you have different skill levels of riders, but um, you know it can take like eight hours. It's a long day to get down there and back. I mean, you're riding 100 miles, and so. Um, you know, I, my road bike was broken. I used my hybrid bike. I, I, I was in sneakers. I was kind of a last minute spur of the moment thing. And I mean, I, I, I ride, so I thought I could do it at least. I mean, worst case scenario, take the train back from DC, I thought, but, um, you know, I hung in, I made it the whole way. And, um, I rode back with Vinny DeMarco, who's a, uh, like a long time Baltimore political guy, lobbyist, activist, and, um, so you know, you meet people along the way. Bob was great. That ride was great. The the, the joy of being back in Baltimore by the time you make it back and you just kind of like, oh, I can't believe I rode my bike to DC and back today. <laughs> um, so that was that was a lot of a lot of fun. You know, just a fun fun day of being outside and everything and kind of seeing, can I really do this? You know, like yeah. But Lynn, I should ask you some questions, right? Because we're we're getting late on time. Yeah. All right. I'm open. I'm ready. Okay. So um, I wanted to ask you, like, um, I think um, you know, your title is, uh, or you mentioned you're a Baltimore poet in exile. Right. right. <laughs> well, so, I stole that from Ralph Alvarez because he, uh, he called, he said that in my, in the blurb and I said, oh, that. that's, okay. good. that's good. That, that makes it, that makes a good blog title, a little yeah. sub. But it's true, though I think reading reading um, <laughs> reading Lake Montebello and and you know, obviously wrote Baltimore Girls. What is it about Baltimore that has a, a hold on you, or why do you, why do you think know, people I, up in hometown yeah, like that? Good good question. I mean, you know, I lived there from the time I was born at University of Maryland Hospital until I left um, the beginning of sophomore year of college. I transferred from where I was a commuting student at. Um, Notre, College of Notre Dame at that time was called. Um, and I couldn't wait to get out. It was like, get out. I can't, I, I would lie in, in, in bed at night trying to scheme ways I could get out of Baltimore. And for a long time, I just didn't look back, right? But I think, I don't know. It's, I think it's part of the right, part of it is about the writing process. Um, because once I, the, the first, um, say 20 poems that I wrote when I sort of came back into the writing of poetry as opposed to doing academic writing um, as a professor, um, were they were really responding to prompts that Sam Cornish would give people in this writing workshop, the poetry workshop that he taught in Boston at the public library. And he said, and he would start with, come back with a couple poems about your father. Mm. And finish with that, he'd say, I want next week, I want you to write for next week, bring in a poem about your first day at school. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I would think my father, okay, you know, that's very complicated. You know, after years of therapy, I think I understand the themes about my relationship with my father, um, whom I love dearly, but was a very complicated person um, and not a guy that talked a lot about his feelings. So just probing that I you know it was I wouldn't say it's it was therapy because I'd already been through so much therapy maybe it's m more more therapeutic actually because once I write about that that era I kind of I'm done with it mm. I, mean, I love the poems but I don't think about them anymore 
And it's like, there's a section in Dancing Like Montebello, which is about my, my very short in, in, in terms of some long marriages marriage and how it, how I perceive it now as sort of thinking back to where I was at that point and trying to put that into some kind of formal um, um, box, like a sonnet. There are a lot of sonnets in that, in that section. And it's not like I'm sitting there agonizing. I'm just trying to remember what it was like and to put that into words. And again, because it's poetry in a way is fiction. You can do whatever you want with it. You know, you can shift details. You can emphasize things that maybe in real life were not that prominent, but that's part of fashioning it into art. Um, once I'm finished with that, I'm done. I'm done with Greenwich, Connecticut. And this section is called Greenwich Mean Time. Um, and then the last section of the of the book, I'm really trying to look forward more. I mean, you're looking back at the same time, but I'm tr I, I tried to I tried to be more in the head of a of a speaker who's 40, 50, um, approaching 60, who's lost friends um, because some people don't aren't long lived, um, um, who who have friends whose children have died or taken their own lives or had drug overdoses and died. Um, and that's kind of right now. So I think um, my part of what I'm doing as a writer is, is trying to look around and, and see what's happening right now and write about it. And I think that's more challenging because it, it, it can tend to, it can tend to be too, too much about like, current events. I want I want the poem to mean something in five or ten or fifteen years. Hopefully, if anybody reads it. One of my um, one of my favorite poets, um, Jack Gilbert. Um, you know, as a and the the Great Fires. There's a, a poem there about um, you not knowing what's going to stick with you during the course of your lifetime. I think he refers to like the, the like stick to ribs things that stick to ribs like fatty bacon and lentils kind of, you know, it's not right. the train that ran by his house in Pittsburgh, you know, the soot in the white snow. And it's not necessarily something his mother said, something his aunt said. And I was thinking about how it's unpredictable, you know, and, and um, as a journalist even, you do reporting and you sit down to write about it, um, you know, things that come fresh to mind or things that you recall uh, you realize have more weight for some reason. Yeah, um, and I think you find that as a poet, when you're when you're searching, like you're going off of something that stuck with you, inexplicably almost. Or, well, I think I think sometimes, particularly with with poems about family. Um, you know, I grew up in a small family, um, which was unusual in those days for Catholic families to have two children. My parents um, didn't marry late, but the war came and I, my parents had been married for 12 years before I was born. And I have one sister and we were very close family. Um, but there were a lot of complications in the, in the marriage as well. Um, my father had a, a very serious sport fishing accident when he was um, 40. Um, it was like, it was on the Chesapeake Bay. It was on some tributary of the Bay. Um, and I think it took me a long, many years to get the story straight. And I write about it in, in, in one of the poems. Basically, they all went out fishing and they were drinking like crazy. And my father who was a great napper and also a great beer drinker, fell asleep with his foot over the edge of the boat. And it, you know, it, it just banged up against a, a support of this small bridge and his leg was crushed. And as a result, um, it really threw the family into turmoil, my, you know, economic turmoil. Um, for me, this was, you know, it was, I was four. And yet all of that stuff stays with you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and, you know, this is pretty psychoanalytic, but it played out in relationships my whole life. And I see how it affected my mother and my sister. And I think when, whenever I think about stuff, it takes me back to Baltimore. You know, we lived in the same house you know, for most of my childhood and adolescence, the same neighborhood, we had a big extended family. M almost all of them are either, have either died or have moved away. 
there's maybe one cousin who lives in Baltimore still. But, you know, it, it just, it, it was just so much a part of who I was that it, whenever I go poking around and write a poem that somehow I'm trying to convey some insight I have, that it's always with you. I mean, yeah. look, you know, James Joyce, not that I'm comparing myself to James Joyce, but, you know, he left Ireland, right? But that's all he wrote about <laughs> all the time. That's, that's the point I was getting to with the yeah. Baltimore yeah. Poet Exxon. Yeah. Now there's, um, right, those neural pathways. You take the girl out of Baltimore, but you can't take the Baltimore out of the girl. Yeah, exact, exactly. Um, it's, um, so you, you write, um, you know, academically, but, you know, you know more to the, the discussion tonight, like you write, you've written essays and, and um, nonfiction and short stories and poems. I was wondering, like, are you working from one form to next to next, or is it the subject and then you find the right format to fit it? You know what I mean? Are you working in one vein at one time in your life or one part of the year? Yeah. And I think I, I think that my early attempts at doing creative writing were okay, but I got a lot of, I was outshone by almost everybody else in, in my various classes. And I think I lost my confidence and I knew I was good at doing academic writing. I mean, I knew I could write a good critical essay and that's all you do in graduate school. You know, you pick, you don't write poems, you pick apart Stephen Spender and Robert Frost and, you know, uh, Sylvia Plath and, and make arguments about um, how they do what they do. Um, and I did, a, I did that kind of writing for a while. And then when I moved into teaching, because I had a I had a little detour. I went to law school and practiced law for 10 years and I did not love it. And it was sort of an economic decision because I it was hard to get a tenure track job in literature. And um, so I was always teaching on the side, always teaching a course, always teaching a course. And that transitioned into a full-time teaching job, but I was teaching expository writing. So now I had to learn all the theory of pedagogy and, you know, the theory of rhetoric and composition and write about that. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of room left for mm -hmm. doing creative writing. I thought that, and, and I like writing short stories, but I also realized that uh, unless you're, you know, Yumpa Lahiri or, or, or uh, um, I don't know, uh, Jonathan Lethem, you, there's not a lot of big market for short stories, right? So I figured, well, I should try writing a novel. Well, I'm trying to write a novel. It's not as easy. I, I was talking to Kevin about this earlier. I think writing poetry has become an avoidance technique for me so that I don't have to write a novel. We're all, we're all good at that, right? We're all good. Yeah, at but, but a lot of the poetry is narrative poetry. So that's what I'm doing, I guess. I'm I'm trying to take this this wish to tell a story and doing it through a poem. Well, Dancing Lake Montebello is, is, I think, you know, you and I have talked about previously, it reads like, it's like this wonderful memoir in poetry form, you know, from story to story. I mean, there's stories about you being a girl, you know, there's poems about your father, um, all, all those things which are which are great. And I, you can imagine it being, or using, you know, the same kind of skills and storytelling into, into a novel form. Um, you know, it's, um, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm about capable of writing a haiku every once in a while. That's, 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 <laughs> I, I think Those are fun when, when you make it, cause I, sometimes I have a very good friend who's a poet, dear friend, um, and she writes a poem a day and she's now got like 8,000 poems. She's been doing this for years and she says, not all of them are, are probably going to end up in a book. What, what she usually says is, uh, when she's reading to an audience, I write a poem a day, but don't worry, I'm not going to, I have 8,000, but don't worry, I'm not going to read them all tonight. But <laughs> that's incredible discipline. I cannot write a poem a day. I've tried every once in a while. It's kind of like dry January, you know, yeah. productive January, write a poem a day. And when I've done that, I end up with some really good ones. But I also find that when I, when I do a workshop, like a week long workshop, I come away with all this stuff, you know, where I, where you have to, that's really, it's all about go away now and write your, um, 
a poem about the worst summer job you ever had. And I come back and I've got like 2000 words that I scribbled in an hour. And then I have like five poems in there if I pick them apart. So I think, um, yeah, everybody works a different way, but I think, um, yeah. Well, I think one thing as a, as a journalist and mostly nonfiction writer is I, my, my own self, like I learn more about myself, we'll say, or, or, or even my own life from writing about other people, right? They're kind of the mirror for me, you know, and I mentioned, you know, Mary Carol Riley was, my mother had recently passed. And it was nice to speak to a woman who was my mom's age and, and, and a live wire like my mom was. And I wrote about like Roy Campanella, who was one of my dad's baseball heroes, played in Baltimore. I wrote about Babe Ruth, who was my grandfather's hero <laughs> from, from Baltimore. And I think sometimes I'm getting at, I'm thinking about my dad or my grandfather, or at least they've inspired me in a way, right, to carry these stories. And But um, I think it's different, right, for a, for a, a poet or, or a novelist. You're, you're pulling forth, I think, more directly from, from within, from that, that experience, right? I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, and I think even, um, you know, even poets that I really admire for their technical mastery um, who, who don't, who don't seem to completely reveal themselves. Um, and I'm thinking of Philip Larkin. They do. They do. They display who they are. They well, don't I want to go out into the world to write. You know what I mean? Like I need to get, go meet somebody, go to an event, go visit right. or a building, like something like that animates me, you know, yeah. where I think, you know, people I know are poets and, and fiction writers, they can like be in the room, uh, you know, in the writing room at home. And yeah, to, I think maybe yeah, more. maybe maybe have taken notice of something in the world, but that it's to me, it's more like watching people and watching what they do and how they live their lives. And suddenly, I'm struck by something, and I think, what if you change the details just like this? Mm. What if you know instead of leaving the marriage, um, they found a way through this crisis into some, into a different kind of marriage. You know, they start to imagine, just sort of changing the details and changing the narrative, and then it becomes fiction. I'm fascinated by people's stories about their lives. I, you know, I, I'm all, my husband says, I said, I know I'm just nosy. He said, well, you're curious about people. No, I am nosy about them because I want to think about it and I want to put them in a poem or a story, but I want to change it. So maybe, maybe we share that trait. I'm like a, a compulsive, um, I invent people's backstories. <laughs> when I meet them, right? Like I invent like where they're from and, and um, you know, strangers, right? That I see, I met. I, and I get a, I think, you know, just as we all have uh, families and friends and ex-spouses and children and, and come from somewhere and move and change careers, that everybody you meet is like that, right? Like so. But I think you're right. I know it's like we had a guy come and clean, clean our gutters, which my husband used to do. But I said, you know, I think there's like a cutoff age at which you shouldn't do this anymore. And the guy came and I had found him like on one of these neighborhood chat things. And he was great, but he, he was a very interesting guy. And I, I started like inventing a backstory for him, right? Yeah, I didn't write it, but it so, made me so A lot of your, your poem you, in, in uh, Dancing Lake Montebello is, is memoirish, but you, you said your novel is a, is a, a little bit different. Are you? Are you? Yeah, I'm not, I, I, yeah I really. I, I don't want to talk about it too much. I was. I was instructed by one of my good friends, who's a writer. Don't talk about it until you, until it's like, you know, in proofs or something. So it's so it, it's so long and big and needs to be pruned. I just finished rereading A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, and I was like, oh God, I wish I'd written that book. <laughs> um, then I'd be finished. It's a it's a it's a story of growing up. So therefore, the setting is Baltimore, and and although the the protagonist is very different from me in many ways, you know she she lives on a street like the one I grew up on, you know, um, and uh, sorry, um, and her father's a lot like my father. Yeah. And he a bar, but it's not in Highland Town, but he owns a bar. 
and she goes to a Catholic school. It's in Greek town. That's the or Little Italy or something, right? Yeah. No, it's actually not there either. But um, and she has an an aunt who's a lot like my aunt, you know, and so on and so forth. But everything is different, and a lot of it is completely fabricated. Just comes yeah. up, and I think that's the thing. I think you think that's the thing about a really long work. It's also true about a poem. With a poem, you kind of know where you're going. You just don't know how you're going to say it. You know what the observation is. You know what the emotion is that's driving it. But with with a long work of fiction, I mean, even a short story too, you start out, and all of a sudden, it kind of takes you. O it takes you over, mm. and and you don't. I didn't know. Like uh, things happen in this book. I was like, whoa, I didn't see that coming, but I think that'll work. So, yeah, I think it's, I really feel like I I, I need to stop writing poetry for a while <laughs> and work on this con more consistently. Yeah, I think we all um, write things that we know how to write when the thing we really want to get to, we, we're, we're procrastinating, right? We're pushing yeah. off. Yeah, yeah. So I was, one of the things, you know, you're, We'll, people say you need to write about what you know. And, you know, as a journalist or whatever, I'm often writing about things I have no idea about or, or something. No. Until I start doing the research, the reporting, yeah. the writing. Yeah. And, that's and, and, interesting advice that's given to to young writers, write what you know. Yeah. I heard, I, I was, I saw a documentary on Toni Morrison earlier this year on like American Masters. And, and she said, I told my students, don't write what you know. Use your imagination. Don't write what you know. Create something. And it was like completely counterintuitive. Mm. And I thought, now there's a, I mean, it doesn't mean you, everyone has to write sci-fi, but it, she was really pushing them to get outside their little boundaries. And it's a very interesting advice because I'd never heard anybody give that advice before, but, you know. Yeah, I think, well, I was going to say, I think it, it means something a little bit different to me now, you know, that um, I remember writing stories a lot about, um, recently did a story in you know, Reverend Hath Alvin Hathaway is working on rehabbing um, Thurgood Marshall's elementary school. Mm -hmm. And you know, I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up in that neighborhood. I, I, I didn't, you know, um, I didn't grow up in Baltimore even, but you know, I think writing about what you know is like understanding, like essentially Reverend ha Alvin Hathaway grew up in that neighborhood um, and, and, and is where he's now trying to rebuild this school. You know, um, it uh, he went to school with Elijah Cummings uh, um, and he's going to have, it's going to be a nonprofit kind of hub. And he's going to have a replica of like of Elijah Cummings campaign headquarters, you know, with artifacts and, and stuff. And so, you know, the, his connection to where he grew up, to his school buddies, to his friends, to his neighborhood, his community, why he's spearheading this effort in hopes of being an economic development hub. You know, then I begin to understand and relate to it, right? Then I am writing about something I know. Cause like we've said, I'm, I, I'm close. I know where I grew up now, meaningful was to me, how meaningful growing up in Baltimore was, your family, your friends, that time period. He's part of his, he's connecting to that himself, right? So then I am writing about something I know in a sense. I, I think about that with more as I get older that Toni Morrison say, maybe saying invent something, but ultimately whatever the themes or ideas are, right? You're there, there's something you understand to be able to write about it or, yeah. or you work through it, right? You come to understand it through the writing process. Yeah, yeah. And that's what she did. I mean, in Song of Solomon, I mean, she, she was writing about things she had heard, but she was making things up too. She was writing about a world she was aware of, but she was she was changing it. She was transforming it with some of this sort of um, magical realism. Hmm. So, so do you have um, any anything that you are any Baltimore writers or any other writers that you're that you're reading at the moment that? Um, how am I reading at the moment? I've been I've been reading a lot of fiction lately. Um, during COVID, it seems I've read more fiction this year than I have in quite a while. Right now, I'm 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 te I'm teaching a, sh a short story course, the American short story. And at first, I wanted to 
to make it um, short stories from 1960. And so I read all these different short stories. And then the more I read the earlier ones, because I wanted to do it chronologically, the more I thought, I can't, I cannot broaden the horizons of these uh, 50 and older students that I have in this class, um, this community education class, by just reading like John Updike, the Johns, John Cheever, and so on. This is, this is not, you know, so I ended up reading all these short stories. And finally, we, I, I went for the diversity. So, you know, we did read John Cheever, the swimmer, but next week we're going to read a Jhumpa Lahari and we're reading a, um, what's the other, I'm trying to remember, I'm just blanking now on who the other author is. Oh, um, oh, uh, Juno Diaz. Right. Fiesta. And I love Juno Diaz. So, yeah. but, so I've been reading a lot of short fiction and, and, um, but I, but I'm also working, reading a couple novels too. I, I just also finished Natasha Trethewey's memoir, um, Memorial Drive, about her mother, um, who was murdered by her ex-husband, mm -hmm. Natasha Trethewey's stepfather, um, some years ago. And it, it, this is the most powerful memoir I've read in a long time. Um, here's a poet writing a memoir. And I also listened to some of the audiobook, which reads like poetry. I mean, she reads it. It, but um, Baltimore writers, you know, I I I always you know I read every mystery novel that Laura Lipman writes, whether it's standalone or whether it's part yeah. of the series. Um, I um, I don't think I, you know I don't Ann Tyler. You know, I've always read all of her stuff. But no, I just read very broadly, right? You know, I just finished a, a, a novel by a, a British author, Tessa Hadley, that I quite liked. I thought it was really terrific. I'm reading it starting in American Marriage um, tomorrow, probably. So I just, I'm reading widely. And but during the time that I was teaching um, expository writing, a lot of my courses were based on law. So I was teaching courses about Supreme Court decisions and I read tons of nonfiction. Years went by when I maybe would read two novels in the summer. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm, and I'm reading poetry all the time, you know, and I'm reading a lot of black poets right now, contemporary ones, Terrence Hayes, Dennis Smith, um, Patricia Smith, um, Tracy K. Smith, all the Smiths. Um, just, um, there's so much out there. And I try to just have it in front of me um, every day every day because we, you know, I can whip through it and then go back and reread some that I like, especially liked. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I'll just throw a couple folks. You know, I've been um, like most people is inundated with news all the time. And I really turn on the television with, because of the, of COVID you have all these faces, people's faces looking. Yeah, yeah, right. at it. And I liked it better when they were talking to each other because I could kind of ignore them and do my work and TV on the back. And now they're all like, but, um, you know, uh, one Baltimore writer, Danielle Evans has a great uh, book came out late last oh, yeah. year. Um, yeah. Office of historical records and the office of historical records, Danielle Evans, I'll say her name again. She teaches in the Hopkins writing program, uh, which is just fantastic read. And, and I was just thought, you know, some ways just fiction explains the world in ways that nonfiction just can't. I just loved her book so much. And um, Adam, Short, Adam Schwartz is a Baltimore school teacher, has a, a collection called The Rest of the World, which was very good as well, a collection of short stories. Um, stuff that he pulled out of being a Baltimore City school teacher for the past, you know, like two decades, you know, stories of his students' lives and were really, um, were really great. Um, things that I've, a couple of things that I've enjoyed. I, I definitely commit to re reading you know, more fiction, I think, uh, out of the Donald Trump era and the COVID pandemic, I mean, I think the amount of news I'm consuming is way too much. Well, that's interesting because my, my response was to consume as little as possible. I did a lot of campaign work in the fall, but um, it was right from the my desk, um, texting, phone banking, postcard writing. Um, but I, I tried not to watch. I would read, I'd give myself about 45 minutes to read 
news in the morning and that was it. We just, we don't, the television isn't even on the main living floor. We, we both are sort of like that. And it's fine with me because I, people would say, Oh, I, you know, I'm so stressed. And I wasn't, I was sleeping a lot and I was, I was writing and I was reading and baking. <laughs> I was baking. I've, I've read a bunch of not a bunch of nonfiction books. I mean, a lot of it, Baltimore, um, I've got a monster and, and now we own the city about the gun trace task force from, some great Baltimore journalists, um, Maynard Woods and Brandon Soderbergh, and the, the recent one from Justin Fenton, and uh, the Black Butterfly from by Lawrence Brown. And I have to get a and, list from you. Yeah, but it's it doesn't feel like a break from the news reading really nonfiction generally yeah, for me. Well, Not, unless it's historical, it may. But I really, um, you know, Tanahishi Coates, another. Oh uh, well, he's like, he is like, he's one of my ma one of my big favorites. Um, I I. I taught um, his his memoir in one of my classes. Um, I think it was contemporary. I used to teach a course on The Wire, and um, that was hard because you, I had to choose which seasons I was going to use because we couldn't. I couldn't give them that much watching, and we certainly weren't going to use class time for that because it was a writing course. But the, um, I thought that that worked really well. But I, his his later stuff is great too. I mean, you know the. I just think he's terrific. You know who I really like is uh, Colson Whitehead. Love yeah. Colson Whitehead. I, I love everything he writes. I read. I, I still. I'm going to go back and read um, his his first one, the the, uh, the autobiographical novel, um, Sag Harbor again. But I I think I'm going to read the Underground Railroad again too. I just I love his stuff. I think he's terrific. Very talented. I heard him, I heard him read it at my college a couple of years ago. He's He's quite sweet. I just, oh, so good. Yeah. Well, I think there's one thing that's, I think, come out of the out of the pandemic. I think people did read more, right? Like people were buying books, right? It's what we could do. Yeah, they, when, were. When they were. They were going outside. <laughs> we couldn't be indoors together. And so it's an interesting combination: people being inside and, and reading more, and. Um, and then being outside because it was safe. I think, um, you know, I think I, I think it's 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 the death of books or whatever has been, um, you know, predicted. But people are reading, right? Like more than more than ever, which is yeah, yeah. I think you're right. And I think there are many more book groups. Um, a lot of book groups continued on and now kind of spread because through Zoom you can have book groups with people who live in California or, you know. Florida or wherever else, if you're sitting in Baltimore or Boston or, you know, I think it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how many of those just revert or go away, wither away when we can get back. Um, but I think, I think it's been an interesting period of uh, reassessment about a lot of things for a lot of people and, and writers as well. Like what, what am I going to do next that that's important for me to, in terms of writing? Are you in a writer's group? Have you have you done that? The uh, either either in Zoom or before, where you're workshopping your stuff and everything. I do. I was. I I did. I have a couple small writers groups um, that meet in person, um, but very irregularly. I don't have one of these show up every week with something, you know. But I tend to do is more if there's some, like I'm going to do a, a one week course. The summer in June that March Piercy, the writer, is going to do on Cape Cod, and you know all the other people who are coming to this, and some most of them they're all poets. Um, they've all published, so you, you kind of get together with a group like that for seven or eight hours a day for five days in in a row or six days, and it, it, there's a lot of you know everybody critiques everyone else's stuff, so mm -hmm. it's very intensive, and I I hope that. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll learn something more, um, but I, I'm not. And, and part of that's because I live in a suburb. I guess I would have to travel, you know, to Cambridge or something that, that's on the other side of the river to, to be in a writer's group. But I might do that. You know, there's the, that might be something that I contemplate. I do, do show a lot of my work to um, one poet in particular. Um, and then I have a first reader who's an old friend and roommate who was an English teacher for years, and she's ruthless critic. She's terrific, terrific. Yeah, I mean, I thought about doing it with um, with some fiction work that I'm working on, just because I'm, I'm sure my 
one or two friends that I talk about writing with are going to be really sick of hearing about it um, if they're not already. Well, you that's know. the other thing, yeah, yeah. Really, <laughs> Don't touch just it. Just communication to each other might be helpful. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing what, what, what you come up with. Oh, yeah, me as well. Yeah. Um, well Ron and Lynn, I'm, I'm going to jump in and, and just uh, do a quick wrap up. And thank you both very, very much for taking the time to do this and try out this format. And uh, uh, Ron, uh, your your IT department is is on the job, which is good. You managed to do it. I'll call you the next time I've got Wi-Fi issues because <laughs> when it happens to me, I'm done. Uh, but you, you managed to come back. So um, thank you both. And, and we have loved working with both of you and loved uh, publishing your work. And, you know, we have a motto of when we're reviewing manuscripts, uh, if it's good, we got to get it out. We got we got to publish it. And we felt that way about both of your your uh, your manuscripts. So um, congratulations. You. Yeah. Congratulations on the sex success that you've had. And uh, thank you. Hope, hope to have you back on here. Well, thank you. Thank we, love, we love Apprentice House Press. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you guys thank are the you. best. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you both. And uh, with that, just wanted to wrap up and say thank you to everyone who tuned in live and going forward. Uh, you can always go to ApprenticeHouse.com to check out all of our books and uh, learn about what we're doing and how we're teaching the world of publishing. You know, the, the goal is to, to get many more publishers out there publishing many more great works. And we're hoping that our students as they graduate become those staff and, and those directors and uh, uh, acquisitions editors and beyond. So um, you can always buy our books online. A reminder that if you go to ApprenticeHouse.com, use the code word STREAM for 20% off all purchases. And with that, so long.